for introductory purposes. Um, today we have Dr. Albert Telfayan from Brown, just up the coast. Um, he is a professor of neurosurgery at the Brown Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and he's the vice chair for quality improvement and the director for the Center for Minimally Invasive Endoscopic Spinal Surgery there. He completed his undergraduate degree at Columbia before then completing an MD PhD at Brown, um, a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale in human electrophysiology, epilepsy, then residency at UPenn, followed by a pair of fellowships in epilepsy and functional neurosurgery and pediatric neurosurgery. Um, he has uh, covered a number of different areas over the course of his career, but has sort of settled on studying min ultra minimally invasive spine surgery and using endoscopy in moving spine surgery forward. Um, so we are welcoming here to him here today to speak to us about advances in endoscopic spine surgery. Um, and I'm going to promote the spine faculty to panelists so that we can have some spirited discussion afterwards. So thank you uh, for joining us, Dr. Tilfayan. We can't hear you yet. I think you just have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. And uh, talking about advances in endoscopic spine surgery, I have nothing to disclose. So the uh, question uh, I'm going to answer with uh, this morning's talk is why we do endoscopic spine surgery. So these are going to be uh, cases I'm going to show you. I'm going to start with simple and go to more complex. And so this is a patient with a far lateral L5S1 disc herniation. And you can see the difference. The exiting nerve at L5S1 is the L5 nerve. And you can see it's kidney bean shaped here, okay? As opposed to the L4 exiting nerve at L4-5, which is round. And on the axial T2 image, we can see it out here in the foramen. And because of the sacral ala, this is very difficult to get to with uh, open procedures or two procedures. And many people do a fusion for this. So this is a cadaver where I've removed the facet. And so this is L5-S1. This is the S1 pedicle. This is the L5 pedicle. This is the traversing S1 nerve root. This is the exiting L5 nerve root. Okay, the space between these two nerves is one centimeter. So we're gonna go in with an 18 gauge, 25 centimeter spinal needle. And we're gonna target the medial wall of the S1 pedicle, okay? We want to be as far away from the L5 nerve root as possible. And we're going to use sequential reamers to remove the ventral portion of the superior articulating process to open up this space so we don't lean on the exiting nerve root. And then we're going to advance a camera, this, um, a working channel endoscope the size of a number two pencil, into the space. And that camera has a 30 degree angle. And by turning the scope, we have a 360 degree view of this brain, okay? So here is um, a cartoon of what we're actually looking at. And we remove this ventral portion of the SAP. So this is like opening a window shade to the brain. So it gives us better visualization, but it also allows us not to push on the exiting root. And so this is what it will really look like opening up that frame. So step-by-step, step, um, we use AP and lateral fluoroscopy all these surgeries that I do are done with the patient awake with a little bit of sedation, so they're able to converse with me. Here, the patient's lying on her stomach. Her head is to the left, her buttocks is to the right. I've drawn a midline, a pedicle line, a disc line, and then these are just lines I've done to orient our fellows. There are 10, 12, and 14 centimeter uh, lines horizontal to the midline. And this is the target line, where I have the target as that superior corner of the end plate. I'll advance an 18 gauge, 25 centimeter spinal needle and target exactly that superior corner of the S1. And at the same time, I'll be at the medial wall of the pedicle of S1. Now it becomes a Seldinger technique. I'll put a K wire inside the needle, make a six millimeter incision over it, advance sequential dilators. So this is just like doing tube surgery, right? I'm dilating out the muscle small, medium, and large dilators. And this is the drill, okay? So the drill is a crown reamer. When I turn it counterclockwise, it won't cut. These are the sharp edges. So I do this by hand. This is just the uh, instrument set, the beveled tubular retractor, ball probe, semi-ventral grasper. 
So the tubular retractor is inside. So the patient is laying prone here. This is the scope. So the tube that's inside the patient is exactly the size of a number two pencil. This is what the scope looks like. It has a three and a half millimeter working channel for instruments and a two and a half millimeter high definition camera. These ports are for irrigation to enter in and come out. People didn't think you could do endoscopic spine surgery in um, endoscopic spine surgery in the spine because there wasn't a cavity. So it's a skim layer that we work with or uh, uh, visualize. And so this is the uh, uh, ball probe inside the patient. And this is what it looks like. So the camera is upside down in the foramen. So this is the exiting L5 nerve group. And so I'm just reaching underneath it and removing that herniated disc with that semi bendable grasper. So the patient's awake during this. And I'm able to turn. You'll see I'm turning this cranially, removing more of this disc. So it's a, this is a, as simple of a procedure as you get in the of the So here's an extreme lateral L45 disc herniation. And you'll see it looks almost identical, except this is the exiting L4 nerve group, right? So again, awake outpatient surgery takes about 22 minutes. So paracentral lumbar disc herniations. So here is a large L45 disc herniation. Target, cannula, and this is six months post-op. So all I've removed is this tiny bit of the ventral portion, the SAP, that you see. And so the disc is completely gone, and you don't have a laminar. Here's a right lumbar five, single one, paracentral disc radiation, pressing on the S1. Targeting. The tube is in the frame. It's not in the glass. And this is what it looks like. So the traversing, that's when the root is going across here. So I'm reaching under that large disc radiation. So it's sort of a portable view. And then you see the voice. So just free herniation. So this patient's had a laminectomy previously and has a large right L5S1 herniated disc. So this is challenging to take care of many times you do a fusion. Um, but by using the foramen, I'm going through a virgin territory. And you can see what this looks like. So this is the traversing S1 nerve group from going horizontally from left to right. There is the green ventral portion of the SAP. And I'll use a ball probe to tease a plane between the traversing nerve root and that disc permeation. And this will be a large, very large disc permeation that I'll pull out of here. But the patient doesn't require a redo laminectomy. The complication rate for this kind of surgery is one out of 500 for infection, spinal fluid leak, nerve damage, um, cranial and caudally extruded disc herniation. So there's a L23 caudally extruded disc, right? It's in the canal, medial to the pedicle. So I'll target, reach around the corner, and there it is. So here's the pedicle, here's the ventral SAP. And here is the disc herniation sitting here. Then I'll reach in. That's the uh, uh, radio frequency probe, essentially it's my bipolar. And I'll reach in with a grasp and just pull that out. Here's a left L3-4 caudal agent disc herniation. So behind the body of L4, we go to the pedicle quite large. Go in with the needle. You see the tooth is in the frame, it's not in the disc. There's the grasper. And this is what it looks like. And so I'll reach in. There's the green SAT. There's the pedicle. And the disc is just sitting there. And I'll also just consume it the grab for a minute. Here's a cranial extruded L5S1 disc. Get back to that. Uh, we'll skip that one. Um, here's a L23 caudal extruded disc herniation by the fusion. Right? The patient had a lateral fusion. Targeting with the needle, tuber trackers in the frame, ball pro medial to the pedicle, and bendable grasper. And again, these are all done with patient awake, outpatient. There is the pedicle, there is the SAP, right? The challenges with endoscopic spine surgery are 
needle targeting and understanding the endoscopic visual anatomy. So that's what we go over each of these things over and over again so that you understand the anatomy. A right L23 caudal disc, uh, disc herniation level fusion. There it is, moving to the pedicle. Pyramidal stenosis. Here's an L45 uh, uh, pyramidal stenosis. This would be a great lateral fusion case. So there's the right L45 frame, the left L45 frame is obliterated, going with the needle. The tubular tractor is in the foramen. This is what it looks like. There's the traversing L5 nerve here. There's the annulus. The sex cyst. This is a 94 year old patient with a foot drop who's already had an L45 laminectomy and presents with a facet cyst. Right, so this would typically be uh, a TLA to remove the cyst and stabilize, but he's 94. Here's his pedicle, here's his SAP. This is an endoscopic diamond drill that I'll use to enlarge the foramen. And then I'll just remove the cyst through this hole. So this patient came in with a complete foot drop using a cane and walked out carrying his cane and his foot was four plus out of five. And he's 94 years old. So here's another post laminectomy with the cyst. You see medial, there's the synovium in the foramen, double tubular retractor. There's the cyst. This is after I move it, the traversing. Spondylolisthesis. This is actually a New York Jets player, um, but it's an L5S1 spondy that's stable on flexion extension. Okay? This doesn't work with that instability, but he's just presenting with radiculopathy. And so this is tip targeting. This is when you first look at remove some of the stigma and flavor and the skeleton isolated. Okay. So this patient has had a micro uh, laminectomy by another surgeon. So you see that's the problem, except the frame is gone. So what we're doing is going in without destabilizing them. And here's another similar case, L5S1, look lateral, and you'll see how the L5 nerve root is compressed. In. This patient has a PARS defect, but doesn't move on flexion extension. It's targeting with the needle, dreaming, and doing a frame anatomy for skeptic. Fusion complications is uh, close to half of what I do. So this patient, when he was 23, he had a minimally invasive two-level fusion with spinous um, spacer. So a lot of times when people are doing super minimally invasive fusions, they're doing a channel discectomy. So this patient presented with a large herniated disc at L45, despite the fusion, there it is, and slightly retropulse pulse So I go in with a needle, green. This is the ball probe underneath the traversing nerve root, and this is all the disc I remove. So here's heterotopic bone uh, from BMP. I do quite a few of these. This is one of my early cases using a blunt tip side uh, uh, shaver drill. And I opened up the frame. This was, he was in a car accident two years later. And so this is what it looked like. He was still asymptomatic. Here's another heterotopic bone at L45. You'll so you see the CT scan completely obliterated. But then I go in with the scope, drill, and when I'm done, it looks like this. This is the pedicle, the SAP, and the traversing nerve. Right. Turning a complex case into something that would be very simple. So just in general, endoscopic decompression for failed laminectomy or failed fusion is usually a case a failed lateral recess stenosis compression, right? So I'm able to go in between the screws. This is the bendable grasper. Use greeners, endoscopic drills. Here's an endoscopic chisel. It's a high definition camera. You can see where the uh, pedal screw is perforated with how full. Here's a patient who's had an L3 through 5 T lift, and he has a pseudoarthrosis at L34. Right? So he came to me because he's not a candidate for general anesthesia. So what I've done here is with him awake, I've gone in, removed the disc on the opposite side, put in BMP bone graft and expandable titanium cage, right? And so he had screw loosening over here. I can see the screw bending when I go in there as I reestablish his height. 
he comes off the table and he's back in his box. There's another similar box. Expandable tooth cage with bone. Okay, again, this is an awake outpatient procedure for a pseudoarthrosis. So post fusion decompression. So this patient has a large um, on leg fusion one here, but he has lateral receptors by his ear. So I go in with a game TV needle, drills, and open with two double dice. So endoscopic frame anatomy. All right, so this patient had an L4 corpectomy by another surgeon and presents with a foot drop. Okay, so this is what the instrumentation looks like. But if you look closely, you can see there's right L4-5 pyramidal compromise right here. So principles are the same. Target with the medial, medial to the L5 pedicle, tubular retractor, reamers, Endoscopic drill, ball probe medial to the pedicle of L5, and this is what it looks like. Here's the SAP and the pedicle of L5. Here's the corpectomy cage. I'll remove bone, ligament, and disc from the foramen, and the foot drop is gone immediately. Okay. So these foot drops are really like a, 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 a compressive palsy, right? So once I decompress it, so it get, foot gets better. Here's another complex case where the patient had a foot drop, tons of screws, but they've developed heterotopic bone, a bone with a drill, do a lot of drilling to get down into that brain and foot drop on Adjacent segment disease. Here's an L5S1, a lot of fusions that end at five C for this compression is going below. Targeting is the same, you have to draw the up one part of it. Sequential violation, which is really new. Keep it in the There's a large L12 disc herniation above a fusion. This is the fecal sac. And this is the ball probe. Essentially, I'm using this as a hockey stick, sweeping it under the fecal sac. And the large disc herniation is extruded. Now, these are patients who've had multiple fusion surgeries and are looking for a minimally invasive outpatient procedure rather than go through another large fusion procedure. Thoracal lumbar disc herniation. So, this T12 L1 disc actually saw me because they referred to me as a tumor uh, because it enhanced with contrast, but here it is in the frame. So, I want you to think of this as stereotactic spine surgery, right? We have the kidneys here. I'm going to have to measure how far off the midline for the targeting. Here, as you go up in the lumbar spine, the framing gets much larger, right? So I measured about eight centimeters off the midline to target this. And this is what it looks like. You put the uh, cannula in, and practically the whole framing is this, removing it. Here's an L12. You can see almost the entire spinal canal is the disc range. This is very morbid if you do it with a micro discectomy procedure because you're moving so much of it to set. And a lot of times these patients will get fused. But for me, this is a simple procedure. I, I, I really don't even have to read. Go in, there's the fecal sac. Again, half of the visual field is the disc herniation, and then just remove it with the uh, graspers. Thoracic disc herniations. Uh, published one of the first ever that where this was done. This is T89 uh, disc herniation over here. This is after reading and drilling. Look what it looks like in the framing. You see a lot of, if you look at this little model that I have, the SAP is quite large in the thoracic spine. So I'll do endoscopic drilling to get there. There's the skeletonized nerve. This is a uh, another T89 disc herniation in the foramen. You can see this is the pedicle of T9, the SAP, and this turned out to be just a soft disc herniation and a piston to add a thoracic lubricant out of it. You can see it starts to pulsate as I remove it. Tumors. So I did the first 
uh, spinal tumor in the world endoscopically. So this was a 15-year-old girl who saw me on Christmas Eve with this large ventral epidural tumor at 2526. And I took her in the night. We did a posture transversectomy and removed it, got a ghost total resection. But the pathology only came back as malignant tumor. So they radiated her. And despite the radiation, the tumor recurred sort of like a chain of grapes. And so to decompress her and get pathology, I went in endoscopically and removed it. And this is what it looks like. It turned out to be a Ewing's like sarcoma. Um, but uh, had the advantage of she's awake and able to ask her to move her legs all through the surgery as I decompress and uh, get tissue. Here's another tumor. This patient was riddled with prostate cancer in agony with this bony tumor here at L5. Uh, he was referred to me by Dr. Lopaslan, who told him that he could either have uh, a large thoracal lumbar fusion or CMA. Um, so just went in endoscopically. I was prepared to drill this fractured bone out, but it turned out to be so soft, I could just remove it um, with the graspers. And again, this is another guy who was in you know, agony from pain who walked out there in his pain. So instantly, and the pathology was positive. Arachnoid cyst, again, I, I told you at the beginning of the case that these would get cases would get more complicated. So this is a 30-year-old with a right L23 arachnoid cyst. Um, I diagnosed this, this was on the CT myelogram, um, and took him to the OR. I wasn't sure this was the cause of his pain, and I decompressed it with a spinal needle. It was diagnostic, and so his pain got better. So here's the SAP. The ball probe is medial to the pep, okay? Over here is the arachnoid cyst, and this is the exiting L2 nerve, right? So this is the arachnoid cyst. So what I've done here is I fenestrate it with the ball probe, I remove it with a grasper, and then I leave uh, um, uh, to seal in a little dural bracket. Cement leakage, this is um, from uh, Ralph Wagner, who I collaborated with. So this is a disaster, right? Um, this patient has osteoporosis, has an L1 uh, compression fracture, and they do a vertebroplasty with cement leakage. So these patients are a nightmare to operate, right? Because they have osteoporosis. So you're the savior when you go in and stop it. There's the pedicle, the SAP, and there's the cement. This is the compressed out Artificial disc complications. So this L45 artificial disc, you can see the fractured bone here in the brain. And typically, if you're treating a complication with an artificial disc, the solution is to do screws and laminectomy. So, but endoscopic spine surgery was the option here to remove that right in the bone. So here's a patient that I saw who 12 years prior had a TDR at Texas Back Institute. And so he came into me with a foot drop and just this left lateral recess stenosis, which is the slight indentation uh, of the L5 nerve. And I was very honest with them. I wasn't sure that this was the cause of it, but it was the only thing that I could see. And so I took him to the OR, and this is what his L5 nerve was like. It was white. After I removed, I almost grabbed it with the grass for After I removed the disc, it turned to me, right? So here it is live. There is the L5 nerve root. And so this was, I published this single case, and the reviewer is very kind because we tend to look at artificial discs like fusions, right? How do they do after two years? Well, it's a motion segment. You know, two years, you know, what happens after 10 years? What happens after 20 years? Um, and so this was interesting, and this was an interesting solution and a very grateful patient. Lateral fusion complications. You can see this uh, lateral fusion implant broke off a piece of foramenal bone. This is a nice little solution, removing that endoscopically. Here's heterotopic bone. The surgeon is BMP and it grew on the opposite side, and they had the cage in slightly oblique, obliterating the foramen. So I knew this was gonna be challenging. So I taped on a navigation star to the patient, and that helped me in allowing me to use the CT scan after to show that I had decompressed it. A-lift complications. This patient had an A-lift 
but patients who fuse can continue to fuse and have despicable bone medial. This is drilling it out endoscopically. And this is the solution. SI joint fusion complications. Here is an SI joint fusion implant that's gone to medially, causing a S1 radiculopathy. This again, this is a Ralph Wagner case who I collaborated with. And he used a one centimeter uh, laminoscope to drill out that medial titanium implant. Perforated pedicle screw. You'd know if you did a large multi segment lumbar fusion and you left your bottom screw slightly medial, um, you wouldn't want to have to open this up to revise that screw. And so in this one, well, uh, I drilled out the medial wall of the pedicle uh, screw there and treated the uh, symptomatic endoscopy. So endoscopic lumbar spine fusion, um, this was the reason I had done this cadaver study, was to do the measurements to see what, you know, realistically um, we can do endoscopically here. This is at L3-4, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, L3-4, here's L4, pedicle L3. This is how the three looks a little bit different. And I did a lot of measurements in here. And this was my first case of doing this endoscopically. The patient has end plate changes here, back pain, and uh, lateral recess stenosis. So the patient's awake, they're going endoscopically. And so this is using uh, per, um, percutaneous pedicle screws. And I'll do a discectomy with the scope. And then I'll put take the scope out, put a slightly larger tube in here. And I'll use minimally invasive instrumentation to do the disc prep, right? Which would be an expandable paddle shaver, um, and uh, uh, an articulated correct. You can see that next slide. So this is the traversing L5 root. So this is an expandable paddle. This is the uh, uh, articulated correct. And then I'll put an allograft EMP and an expandable cage. This is outpatient uh, awake uh, spinal fusion surgery. This is just taking a look at the cage, make sure there's no compression on the surgery. So she's an obese, not very healthy lady who this surgery could be quite morbid. Um, so we're able to do this endoscopic way to get her out. Same day of surgery, she's very happy. She's back to life more quickly. Treating deformity within the seven spine surgery. I never thought I would talk about this, but one of my partners did a two level micro discectomy on this patient and needed me to go do a fusion. So here I've done you know, bone in a bag. Um, and what, the, what this does is um, I'm elevating that disc space. So I didn't realize, but his pre op x ray, the coronal deformity he had, that I had fixed that on his post op x ray. Uh, because I'm expanding those disc space with the fusions. So cervical. I'm going to spend a little time on cervical, but I just want you to be aware of it. This is, you know, really for the residents. So endoscopic cervical surgery is four types of surgery, right? It's a posterior cervical foramenotomy, and these are all done with the patient of sleep. Uh, a posterior cervical laminectomy, an anterior cervical discectomy, and something that's called an anterior transcorporal discectomy. So I published this as a two-level cervical remonotomy. Okay, um, you can see the discs over here. Patient's position prone. Here is patient with cervical stenosis. And this is using the one centimeter laminal scope. And this is just, this is MIS tube surgery, except the tube here is one centimeter in this post op. okay? And then we're gonna go from the front. Okay, so this is a four millimeter scope, and this is a, anterior cervical discectomy for a small channel. And the interesting case here is a transcorporal discectomy. When you go through a small channel in the vertebral body above to go target the disc herniation below. And the reason you do this is so that you don't injure any viable disc herniation. It's like doing a pickpocket. And then when you remove this six months later, it's all uh, gone. Tethered word, we're getting towards the end. Uh, of this. So um, I did this case as sort of a proof of concept. I saw this patient in my office with back pain. He's a workman's comp patient. And he was quite 
animated about what a miserable time he had in physical therapy. And I asked him about it. He said that when they did traction on him, he got uh, an electrocution feeling down to his, his body. And I asked him to turn around, I lift up his shirt, and he had an incision here in a very patch. So I took a closer look at his MRI, and he has a fatty phylum here. So I did the surgery by putting in a tube. And then when I got down to the dura, I made a five millimeter window in the dura, put in my scope. I could see the nerve roots and I could see the fire. So I grabbed it with the endoscopic rasper, brought it out of the dura, put in a, a, a vessel loop underneath it, and was able to section it, send pathology. So this is really a proof of concept so that you know, I hope someday that a fatty phylum surgery could be a perfect venous outpatient surgery. So the last case is spina bifida. Um, so this is, you really don't want to see this if you're a spine surgeon, this patient with spina bifida as a child and has uh, far lateral compression uh, here. So uh, you can see the exiting nerve root L4 is compressed. You can see on the CT, which the anatomy is quite abnormal. So typically what you really have to do is you have to get fusion on these patients here with all that dural malformation, but you go in and stop it with, um, and well, I have a little more advanced particular. Uh, this is just uh, for the anatomy. So this is my collaborator, Dr. Chuck in uh, uh, Germany, but we see this patient has a extruded uh, caudal disc at L45. And over here, the patient has a, a large facet cyst. And in both these cases, he drilled through the pedicle. Okay? And so the anatomy of the uh, L5 pedicle here is about 15 millimeters tall. So there's room to drill a hole through there to be able to access this pathology. So I'm going to end there. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And I want to leave time for any questions. I have a question. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could describe any of the failures or, or lack of successes of any of your early experience with endoscopic surgery? Yeah, so um, the, uh, I had a patient who was a boat captain on a 185 foot yacht um, who I had uh, operated on the owner of the captain and he came and saw me and it was a you know very uh, uh, simple straightforward case until I got in the OR. And I, he had the highest iliac crest I'd ever seen. And so uh, that's a caution at L5S1 with males who have a very high iliac crest that can be quite challenging. People have reported drilling through the crest to um, access that. And so this brings up, it's a, it's a very good question because it brings up the point uh, that I brought up with the first question at the end of the talk is why do we discover this? And so, you don't do it because you can't do a microdis, right? So these patients, so he had the option of having a microdiscopic that would have solved his problem. Um, and what I'm able to offer is, well, I'm gonna avoid general anesthesia. It's gonna be a smaller incision, you get faster back to life and a lower complication rate. But that does you no good if I didn't get treat the problem, right? And so, you know, you have to really weigh for these simple discs, you know, what is going to be the best approach for you. Um, so that's a case that I failed. Got it. And then for the fatty yeah. phylum case you showed, were you able to close the dura with the endoscope or just because the endoscope is so small, you, you didn't uh, worry about it? I used the dura, I used the scope to uh, make a small dura opening. And then it was just a first string stitch. Got it. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Um, a, a quick question. Thank you so much for, for the great presentation. Uh, what is your anesthetic technique for the awake uh, operations? Because we have tried that and we had issues when we're trying to retract the nerve. There was a lot of pain. Do you use anything special? So I typically either use Versed and fentanyl or Presidex and fentanyl. Just those two. And I do it under local. Um, but there's a certain, like, I, I noticed when I was a resident that 
I was good at awake procedures, you know, putting on gamma frames, putting on uh, 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 halos, uh, halo vests. And so a lot of it is I talk to the patient before the procedure. And I explain to them that I'm not going to do anything to you without telling you. Every single step, when I wash your back, um, when I put drapes on, you know, I'm, I, I tell them everything. You know, I ask them, okay, I want you to take a breath, break. We're going to take a deep breath together. There's a lot, there's a lot and, you know, I, I see that, you know, not all physicians are like that, right? If you ever think about, you know, if you see an anesthesiologist put an IV in and they don't warn the patient, right? And so it's like, I really do a lot of psychological support during the weight surgery. So uh, that's part of it. Uh, there was an amazing talk, uh, overwhelming indeed. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by the anterior cervical uh, approach. Uh, it reminded me a little of uh, the Joe procedure that uh, was attracting some interest in the 90s. Uh, did the case that you showed go through the vertebral body centrally, or were you trying to do what uh, the Joe procedure tries to do to come right at the edge of the vertebral artery? So, so the, the procedure, like I used to do the Joe procedure, right? It, 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 is, it is the Joe procedure, right? So, you know, the, the tar, you know, you enter, you know, you're, it, again, it's also stereotactic, right? You know, that if you're going to, you know, how you're going to access it, either if it's a left-sided um, herniated disc, you can either come, you know, left and go straight down, or you're going to come obliquely from the right and target the pathology. So there's a lot of targeting that goes on. <clears throat> I have a question about sort of outcomes and durability. So I, with any new or somewhat new way of approaching something, approaching a pathology, we have a the learning curve of dealing with it, but and we see the immediate outcomes. You, you mentioned them in your talk. That, you know, patients walk out of the hospital, they feel better. But how have you seen the long-term durability of the treatment? To, to be compared to traditional approaches in your experience? Yeah, so everything I do, I study, right? I start, I study the long-term outcomes, everything. So my re-herniation rate is 4.7%, right? Which is completely comparable to open surgery. Right? Oh. Which is the, the complications are lower. When we, when we do, we do meta-analysis, we do all these things. So the outcomes are the same. Right, so you get the same outcome, but you notice that back to work is faster and the complication rate is lower. So that is when you do the side by side. So the reason I give this talk is because we don't do the comparisons for a fusion complication, right? It's just like, so all the, the reasons you do endoscopic spine surgery are not because you're going to philosophize how should I treat this L45 disc, right? It's like, we know how to treat an L45 disc, but if you do endoscopic spine surgery, you're the go-to person for all the failed laminectomy, failed fusion. To, you know, my, my business is complex spine surgery. So the mantra I live in is minimally invasive solutions to complex spine surgery problems, right? So People come for endoscopic spine surgery for their disc problems, you know, because they're sophisticated and they've searched it and they want to avoid a laminectomy. But the bread and butter of what I'm doing is a lot of referrals from other surgeons who see this as a minimally invasive solution, you know, to something that's very complex. So, um, Fantastic talk. I put a few comments in the chat, but I'll just uh, summarize that um, I think you've shown a great experience. I'm not sure this will generalize to everyone's skill set, and certainly you probably built up to this as you alluded to. Um, an interesting question is, um, what is going to be the scope of who tries to do endoscopic spine surgery? Have you seen in your institution pain management doctors or uh, interventional trained people um, try to extend into it? Because the line of spine surgery and minimally invasive pain procedures is kind of blurry. So it's a, it's a great question. So we uh, train three spine fellows a year and 
it's funny you know, that, you know, I, I think every spine surgeon should do endoscopic spine surgery. But then, you know, I realized that, you know, we're all different as spine surgeons. You know, some people tend more towards deformity, some people are more MIS. And so, you know, it's really going to be, you know, the MIS surgeons who are going to take this on. Um, you know, in other areas of the country, um, 10 years ago, like pain doctors would try to get into this field and that still goes on with some areas and, you know, a lot of them are just doing a percutaneous discectomy to, you know, what they do is they stick a tube in the disc and charge for, you know, what we do, you know, for micro discectomy, but, um, you know, there's a lot of forces that are, you know, trying to prevent that. So a great question. Don't you think that this is the same argument or discussion that has been an age-old one comparing decompressive types of procedures with fixation types of procedures? I mean, primarily this, although you've shown some other types of cases, primarily this is used to minimally invasively decompress the nervous system, which gives early relief. And um, that's that's great. And then you could compare this versus the metrics system because yours, you said, is six or seven millimeters, right? Yeah. And then you've got metrics that may be a little bit bigger than that. But isn't uh, this mostly about patient selection as to who is going to benefit in the long term from simple decompression versus um, a more extensive fixation type of procedure? It's a great question. And so the, really the answer is, you don't go on the golf course with one golf club, right? So there's no, there's no need to compare endoscopic to tube to fusion, right? They all have a different role, right? We could use a putter when we get on the green, you know, we use a seven iron 150 yards out, you know, so, you know, each of these has a role. Our job is to sit there and decide what's the best treatment for this patient, right? So, for a far lateral disc herniation, you know, typically L45 far lateral disc, well, you can go down the middle, you know, you can do, you know, a, you can do a Wiltsy open, you can do a tube lateral, you can do endoscopic. So at my institution, no one does an endoscopic, nobody does a far lateral disc. They all send them all to me because everybody's seen, you know what, the best thing is endoscopic. You know, and that's sort of, our experience, it's not that a tube doesn't work. Um, it's just that, you know, when you do it, you have to retract the DRG and that's quite painful. Um, so they're all important techniques. One won't replace the other. I think I've got to go into spine so I can learn the difference between the putters. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just that I think that you know, we're very, the, the field is very exciting and always advancing. And I think that I would leave, the thing that I would leave the residents with is that when I was a resident, we, we still had the WNS Bulletin, which was a magazine we would get. And there was an advice from senior surgeons one month and I read it. And what struck me was one of the surgeons said, if you continue to practice the way you did when you left residency, you will not survive. So the question is, how do you learn these new techniques when you're out in practice? And so that is always the challenge, you know, new things come up, you know, we didn't do lateral fusions when I was a resident, I had to learn how to do it, you know, and nobody, no training program taught endoscopic spine surgery, how do you safely learn these things, how do you weigh what's going to be worth learning, um, so typically when we teach these, we, people have to go to cadaver labs to learn it, they do visitations, you know, and so like in our program, we, you know, train the residents and the fellows how to do this, so you know, as time goes on, there'll be more and more programs like this. I love that last comment because I try to emphasize something similar. Uh, there's no time at which you're going to stop learning and evolving and improving. That's the beauty of being a neurosurgeon. Well, thank you. That was a really lovely talk and we really enjoyed it. Well, I really appreciate the invitation. I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Peter, is that it? I guess that's it, yeah.